Thanks for listening to Chicago's Morning Answer podcast sponsored by Signature Bank. Signature Bank takes pride in helping customers grow their business and provide unmatched banking expertise, custom financial solutions, and the industry's best technology. So whether you're a business looking for a deposit relationship or needs a ready source of financing, Signature Bank is the right bank for you. Call today at 773-467-5600 to hear how Signature Bank can help your business grow and thrive. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Good Wednesday morning, Amy Jacobson here. Honored to be with John Anthony, who's in for Dan Proft today. How you doing, partner? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. All right. Did you check your uh, lotto tickets? Did you check your Mega Millions? Because the numbers drawn were 7, 29, 60, 63, 66, and Mega Ball 15. Uh, Any winners? Didn't win. (laughs) Didn't get it. Darn it. Next time. Well, since since I'm in Utah and the neighboring state of Nevada, neither of these states, you can buy Mega Millions tickets. You can't buy lottery tickets at all. Oh. Um, Believe it or not. You can gamble your face off and lose your house, (laughs) your girlfriend, and your car, um, but you cannot buy lottery tickets there. So everybody goes to Arizona. So I asked Justin Kosick, our technical producer yesterday, to... Buy me my tickets. And do I still, Justin, do I still owe you the two bucks? Uh, no, I'll forgive you the two dollars <laughs> if you give me. Beth and I were talking about this, uh, oh. and I figure about 10 million, maybe f- 10 to 40 million of the winnings. I'm okay. You're cheap. <laughs> uh, you know what? We figured 40, 40 million was 10% of it last night or something yeah. around there. So that's, you know, that's fine. You did well, all the that work, though. Yeah. yeah the you Jack- know what? Forty million that would set me off perfectly. Oh, okay. I mean, if you want to give me more, I will not turn it down. Yes. Well you bought one for yourself, right? Didn't you buy one for the everybody on the show just like the Raising Canes founder did? He bought <laughs> he bought fifty thousand mega million tickets. Whoa. One for each worker. And they all lost. But there's and they all lost. So what I mean, what's he gonna do next time? Is he gonna do like drop another hundred K? Do you think? 312-642-5600, turnkey.pro, answer line 64636, type in DA, then a quick comment. Did you buy a ticket last night? Did you ever play the lotto? Was this enough to convince you? Because the jackpot right now went from $830 million to guess what? Oh. You ready? I, I, I think I know. What do you think it is? It's, it has to be a billion. It, a $1.02 billion. Oh. And the high. <laughs> And the highest jackpot ever was uh, back October 23rd, 2018, at $1.537 billion. But, I mean, with inflation and everything, I I mean, I'd be happy with $830. How much of that will Illinois take? $30 million. I know. Wouldn't that be funny? Because one of my girlfriends always said, if I ever win the lotto, I want to track and see where my taxes on that go. Yeah. Like, what exactly is that helping out? You know, kind of like Ken Griffin when he gives the city two hundred million dollars in personal income taxes every year. Wow! And he's moving to a state where he doesn't have to pay that anymore. Well, remember it was originally in, designed to help offset education. Oh well, yeah. that's right. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and then what happened? <laughs> Greedy politicians. Wasn't that we? Wasn't that what the toll road was about? Mm-hmm. When we were kids, they started. You know, this is just going to be temporary. When yeah. it was. Five cents, and I remember it grew to 10, and then 15, which is always hard to find the change. Yeah. And then they're like, you know what, let's just make it a quarter. Yeah. That's why you never open the door to politicians for any tax, ever. Really? Anytime they want to say this is temporary, never believe them, ever. So did you buy a ticket? I did not, but I, uh, it's a billion dollars now. I will buy a few. Okay. <laughs> to all my, to all the people out there that say, ah, oh, you, you religious, don't buy. No, please. I got one point something billion reasons why <laughs> To spend a dollar or two. Well, with inflation right now, okay, so listen to this, because inflation's, you know, the highest it's been in 40 years. The average Illinoisan needed a pay raise of $5,920 to keep up with inflation during the past 12 months. Wow. That's if, if, you, if you have a family of four, but you have a family of 12, right? Yeah, uh, actually so, 22. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your price doubled. So you're out twelve thousand dollars out of just because of inflation, yeah, because of all this. So well, my grandmother had nineteen kids, 
What? Yeah, 19. Is that your mom's mom? Or my your dad's mom's mom. mom. I don't know 19. my dad. I, I just found my dad's people. Oh, that's right. How's your book going, by the way? It's going good. And what's the t- working title? Uh, yeah, I haven't come up with a title yet. All right. I haven't come you, up with a title yet. But you recently ran into, well, you didn't, You heard the story about your father your whole life, but yeah. how did you find his family? Uh, ancestry, actually. And I took did, the Ancestry DNA test. All right. What did you discover? And I found my family and found out that they're all mostly from uh, Effingham, uh, Robinson, Illinois, Crawford County area. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was it was a very um, eye opening experience to go through that ancestry. Have you met any of your half siblings? I, I I have not met any siblings yet. I did meet my aunt, who actually a month after I visited her, her died. Oh. Yeah, and my cousin, my oldest cousin, still lives down in Robinson, Illinois. Wow. I get to see her every now and again. Okay, but back to your mom and yeah. one of nineteen children. How did did they live in the city? Well, yeah, yeah. It, how um, do you, how do you live? I could barely fit three grown boys in my house, <laughs> let alone, and I don't have a big house. I have a, one of the original A frames yeah. left in the city. Um, but how, how did you? How do you work nineteen kids in the city of Chicago? Well, not all. I mean, they were. I mean, they're, not all of them lived in the house with her. So, okay. Yeah, like my uncle Richard, he was who's the oldest. Uh, I think he was killed at a dice game with Sam Cook. Really? <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, he was a gambler. Yeah, hustler. Oh, yeah. so maybe you shouldn't be buying a lotto ticket. Well, see that? Well, yeah. well, because listen, it'll lead to other things. Please, a billion dollars, huh? A I'll billion point chance. But you two. know what happens to everybody that wins it? You know, turmoil hits their 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 life. Almost every lottery winner, or big lottery winner, they've all had to deal with all type of crap in their life. Oh yeah, yeah. like some of them ended up dying. Yeah. And then people coming out of the woodworks asking you. They did. I remember twenty twenty did a story and they showed this one woman who. I think she won not even, I mean, 40 million, which, you no, know, that's a lot. Yeah. Not compared to 1.02 billion. And the letters this woman received on a daily basis asking for help wow. was by the, I mean, it was just buckets of yeah. mail yeah. every single day because they found out who she was. In certain states, you don't have to um, show your identity yeah. or reveal your identity, excuse me. So, you know, certain states, uh, Illinois, you don't have to reveal your identity. You have to come forward, but you can wear a costume or a bandana what? or sunglasses. Oh, yeah. See, I Each would like state. that here. Read the back of the ticket. What would, you, what would your disguise be? I wouldn't be? want anybody to know who I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, what would know. your disguise maybe a, be? Maybe a Jason mask. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Myers mask, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> well, back to that Raising Cane's founder, though, buying everyone tickets, there's, there's a caveat with it because then whoever wins – because each person didn't actually get the ticket. He bought the tickets on their behalf and then didn't hand them out to each employee. Oh. So it was a pool. So whoever won, then they'd split. You know, each employee would get between two to $3,000 each. That's it? I guess that's what, if you did the math and oh. if you do the, you know, the cash out. So I don't know. I just... I'd rather buy Todd my own Todd Grace ticket. is his name. Yeah, and he said, buying 50,000 lottery tickets is harder than you think hoping to share the winning jackpot with our 50,000 Raising Cane's crew. It's a good publicity stunt, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, you can't buy that kind of airtime on TV stations across the country. Yeah, I'm still a Chick-fil-A fan, so. Oh, <laughs> I know, I'm not a Raising Cane's man. No, I tried it. So did I. My it's kids love it. Yeah. I don't, I'm not into it. I don't know what it is. I think it's, I don't know. Yeah. I like, I'm a, I'm a Chick-fil-A guy. Y'all know who, whose son works for Raising Cane's, right? No. That Ooh. would be, that would be my number two. He oh. works for Raising Cane's corporate. I love Raising Cane's. Yeah, it's sure the, you do I now. Still, <laughs> you freaking flip flopper. Hey, I'm gonna be honest. I still don't. I am a former Come on Democrat, now. so I'm a flip flopper. Hey, it's a different. It's a different. Uh, Chick Fil A sandwiches. Raising Cane's yeah. has zero sandwiches. Right. They'll never have a sandwich. And they need spicy chicken. They don't have any spicy chicken. They don't need it. Oh, come they don't on. need it, dude. They don't so, need it. They they are so. In the pocket right now. They are the fastest growing yeah. restaurant chain Good for them. in the country, maybe the world right yeah. now. And they so are just wait. going great guns. So what did your son say about getting the lotto ticket? He was, they're excited about it. This is what okay. Todd Graves does. And uh, uh, on a general level, usually below the fold of the newspaper or no one ever knows what Graves does. He started this on his own back at Louisiana State University with the first restaurant. 
um, and has just grown this into uh, an incredibly good organization. Yeah. And, um, yeah, Ian's, uh, Ian works on the corporate level for, for Raising Cane's. And they, were, and they were excited about it because Graves does this kind of stuff for the entire crew, the entire teams, down to the, right. down to the guy who uh, hands you your stuff at the window at the drive through mm-hmm. and he does it all the time. Oh. So it goes from that all the way up to corporate. Yeah. I wonder if he bought himself a few lottery tickets. Oh, so I, what, what's his follow up going to be? I don't know. Mike? I don't know. He does. You know, Ice T's doing their uh, doing their ads yeah, now. Yeah, so you I know, saw that. and it's uh, my son tried to actually buy a cardboard cutout of Ice T, <laughs> a plane ticket home the other the other day and got denied. But uh, yeah, it's a it. You know, Graves does a lot of good things for the organization as long as he stays in contact with it. They'll be in fairly decent hands. Yeah. And where are their headquarters work. based? Their headquarters is in Dallas. Again, they started in uh, in Baton Rouge, uh-huh. uh, which is where Graves went to school at LSU, mm. and then uh, eventually the uh, corporate uh, the corporate design function went to Dallas. Just easier to run out of there. And Graves doesn't even have his hands day to day in it anymore. Oh. They have a chief operating officer and uh, other folks who uh, run the day-to-day, the restaurant operation. You know how I don't trust the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. I trust you. Um, But was that true that each employee, they didn't actually get their hands on the ticket? No, no, he bought them, and uh, Graves bought them out of his own pocket. This wasn't a corporate purchase. He bought them out of his own, his hundred grand, bought them out of his own pocket, and it took eight hours to print all the tickets. Eight hours. And yeah, he was just going to divide up, divide it up among all fifty thousand crew members. Oh wow! Okay. If one of those tickets won, then each of the fifty thousand employees of Raising Canes would get a slice. Nice. And which I mean, one ticket's got to be worth something, don't you think? Out of fifty thousand tickets, I don't think it, I don't think John's math is too far off. It's two to five thousand dollars, something like that, for each for each employee. Yeah. And uh, you know that's a nice bonus. You'll be responsible for your own taxes on that, my friends. <laughs> oh, exactly. But, you know. Well, the odds of winning are one in. You ready? One in three hundred and two point six million. Woo! So yes, the odds are definitely stacked against you. Dan and Amy, Chicago's morning answer. Before you see it on TV, share it on Facebook, or read about it in the paper. Hear it here first. This is Chicago's morning answer. On AM 560, The Answer. Are you a business owner with a strategic mission, a drive to succeed, and a plan for growth, but you just need the right bank? Hi, Mike Gallagher here, letting you know that Signature Bank is all about going the distance for commercial banking customers. It's what Signature Bank does every day. Their team understands that accessibility is key to their culture. In times like these, you want a bank that is there for you to weather the bad times and capitalize on the good. And with Signature Bank by your side, you can't go wrong. It's a true partnership. That's why Signature Bank in Chicago is my bank. That's right. I'm a customer. I believe in what they have to offer. From innovative tech and customized solutions to help your business grow and thrive. Reach out to my friends at Signature Bank. Call 773-467-5630. 773-467-5630. Or visit them online at SignatureBank.Bank. That's SignatureBank.Bank. Signature Bank makes commercial banking personal. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM560, The Answer. All right, good Wednesday morning. His valiant return to Washington, D.C. Former President Trump went back there after 552 days after leaving office, and uh, he spoke at the America First Policy Institute, and uh, it sounds to me, John Anthony, like he's going to be running for president. He's definitely running. That no, Our no. country is now a cesspool of crime. We have blood, death, and suffering on a scale once unthinkable. We got millions and millions more votes. What a disgrace it was, but we may just have to do it again. 312-642-5600, turnkey.pro, answer line 64636. Type in DA, then a quick comment. Are you all in? Are you in? You you never Trumpers? Are you maybe now in for President Trump? You never Trumpers? Are you still that never Trumpers? And the Trump fans 
I mean, they want him so badly to run. What do you want him to do, John Anthony? Uh, if he runs, I'm with them. Okay. I like DeSantis, but if Trump runs, I'm definitely I'm going with Trump. Why? What do, What do you like about Trump? Uh, look at Look at our nation. Look at Look at our nation. <laughs> look at the world when he was in office. You know, they may not have liked him, but they but the world respected him because they thought he was crazy, and they they weren't willing to do what the world. I mean, look at Joe Biden. He went to Israel. He went to Saudi Arabia. Came back with his with his tail tucked between his legs. You know, I mean, they wouldn't have done that to Trump. No. You know? And Trump would have gotten Brittany Griner back a long time ago. Yeah. We would have not have had that disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, Correct. which made the whole world laugh yeah. in America when people are hanging on the plane as fuel it's prices, leaving. Fuel prices wouldn't have gone as high as they, they've gone, you know, because I mean, we, we were the number one exporter. You know, we, I mean, we were doing really well. I mean, we, were, we opened up Keystone. I mean, you looked at the Arctic. We were looking to um, drill in the Arctic. I mean, and, and then Joe Biden comes in and just shuts everything down. Day one, shuts it down. <sighs> and the, the, the irony is all those union pipe fitters in Wisconsin, there's about 10,000 of them. They all voted for Biden, and they all lost their jobs yeah. his first day on the job. Yeah. Lost it. Yeah. So here's so Fox News, which I don't know if they're in Trump's camp or not, or they're just, you know, taking an outside look at what's going on. But they went to Maricopa County. You know, that's where Phoenix yeah. is, Scottsdale. Sheriff Joe. <clears throat> in Arizona. And uh, interviewed people on the streets about, do you want Trump to run or sit this one out? I don't want him to. I like, uh, like what he stands for. I like what he does. But uh, he uh, upset too many people and he upset him really bad. So I don't think he's good for the party. He needs to get back in. That He already had gained that respect from all the world leaders and finish what he, you know, started. It's too bad that he did what he did do and was fought the whole way along on darn near everything that he did, but that's what happened, so I'd like to see him not run. If he did, I would vote for him, but I would not recommend he runs. I I, I voted for Trump both times, and I, I, I love him. I, I think he was a good candidate, but I think his time has passed. I couldn't care less about uh, President Trump uh, personally. Um, uh, I, I prefer somebody different, but if he is the nominee, I'll probably vote for him. You know what? I voted for him for my my very first time I voted for him. I don't think it'll be best for our country for him to run for re-election. You know, I'm thankful for everything that he's done, but I think that our Republican Party needs to be united. At this point, he's a little too polarizing, and I think that there are candidates out there, Republican candidates, obviously, that... Um, maybe be able to pull in people that he would lose to be able to change this. 312-642-5600, turnkey.pro answer line, 64636. Type in DA, then a quick comment. I, I'm, I've got some reservations. I mean, I'm very appreciative of his Supreme Court nominations. I'm support, supportive and appreciative about his America First policy and inflation was at an all-time low yeah. when he was in office, and unemployment numbers were at an all-time low. Yeah. Um, but I just don't know if it's right for the party, because I am a DeSantis person. I've been watching, and we've all been watching over the past you know, three years of how he's handled the coronavirus, yeah. and, and it's just been a free state, and he just seems, he's level-headed, he's served our country, um, and he's young. I mean, I, I got the, the, the honor, I got to go to Mar Largo to watch uh, 2,000 Mules, and I realize like, Trump's old. Like, yeah. He's old. Biden's old. I mean, Trump's a, his, he's a lot more with it than, of <laughs> course, Biden is. Um, Biden but who? I just think it's 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 time to move on. I think he'd be better served if he supported up and coming Republicans See, like I, DeSantis. Guess what? Trump DeSantis is the dream ticket. Twelve years, yeah. 12 great years of 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 good leadership, respect, respectability. I'm team Trump. Okay, three one two six four two five six zero zero turnkey dot pro answer line. Convince me. Uh, let's go to Candace in Mount Pleasant. Good morning, Candace. Good morning. Good morning, Candace. Hello. Hi. Okay, I really hate the way that Trump handled COVID, and um, and I don't think he should ever tweet again personally. Um, but but um, but I'm all for him because I like a baller. Yeah. And I want to, you know, and, uh, and you yeah, know, he tweeted, no, he tweeted left. his way out of office. I swear to God. Um, 
but yeah, the COVID thing and then, you know, ending up with communism um, was uh, quite upsetting. But yeah, I want a baller because now we need a baller. We They have shown themselves, they've shown their, you know what, and now we need a baller to yeah. take care of them. And really to, and I think to just take down the whole federal thing, the whole federal thing. Uh, education, did you see Betsy DeVos said that education, federal education has to go? Yeah. Well, she uh-huh. didn't say that five years ago, but isn't that, I mean, that's I what know. I want. Everybody that's what I a... want. Don't give me, don't give me this, uh, um, I want a uh, free choice. No, we're beyond that. It's dead. It's got to go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks, Candace, for your phone call. Appreciate it. Let's but, go to, oh, yeah. What did you want to say? But, you know, po- uh, I'm glad that he's polarizing. I, I, you want somebody like that. You want somebody that shows you. Who the who the bad people are, and that's what Trump was able to do. He was able to expose these people. So I'm I'm with I'm telling you, we need Trump back in office because because of what he was able to do when he in just four short years. Well, what is he going to get the black vote? I mean, I'm telling you, listen, I've been talking to a lot of black Democrats. They said if he runs, he's, they're voting for him because they realize actually what he was trying to do for the black community. What is Joe Biden? What is what is J.B. Pritzker? What is what have these people done? Nothing. Oh, they just sit there and lie and say, yeah. crime is down. If I hear Mayor Lightfoot say that one more time, I'm going to tear out my spleen with a rusty spoon. How they're spoon. reporting crime is down. Yeah, exactly. It's about how they're reporting it. And the clearance rate is up. No, because they when the crime is not solved of a certain amount of time, they just take it off the books. Now I sound like I'm talking like I'm a Chicagoan. <laughs> All right, let's go to Rich in Indian Head Park here on Chicago's Morning Answer. Hey, good morning, Amy. Good morning, John. Good morning. Uh, I would definitely vote for... Uh, President Trump again, as long as it's after the midterms. And the reason why I would vote for him is because everything that's going on in the world today could have been avoided if he was president. We would have never had Ukraine. We'd have been uh, energy independent. The inflation rate would be down. So all of those people that were on the fence that voted for him and, and didn't like his tweets are finally realizing that uh, they should have uh, voted for him the way the country's going today. Thank you, guys, and have a good day. Yeah. Right. You too, Rich. But listen, then, you know, he gave a speech yesterday, and if you've watched any of his rallies, it's the same thing, you know, talked about how life was better, crime was, you know, low when he was in office. But then he comes out and says something like this. Perhaps some people will not like hearing this, but the only way you're going to remove the hundreds of thousands of people and maybe throughout our nation, millions of people we're talking about, and help make our cities clean, safe, and beautiful again, is to open up large parcels of inexpensive land in the outer reaches of the cities, bring medical professionals, including doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, drug rehab specialists, build permanent bathrooms and other facilities, make them good, make them hard, but build them fast, and create thousands and thousands of high-quality tents, which can be done in one day, one day. This is to take you care of the homeless You have to move people out. Now, some people say, oh, that's so horrible. No, what's horrible is what's happening now. Because now they're in tents, but most of them aren't even tents that function. Oh. That's how he would deal with the homeless situation, yeah. especially in Los Angeles and in, in California. And in San Francisco, where in L.A., there have been two, you know, one, one, the NASCAR driver was killed pumping gas. Yeah. This crazy homeless yeah. man just came up and stabbed him in broad daylight. And another, the, the Olympic volleyball player, she was hit over the head and beaten with a metal pipe yeah. by a crazy homeless person. Yeah. So, I know, that's just it was very lot, provocative of, it, of him a, yesterday. A lot of it has to do with the mental health. Yes. The states and cities have, have just, you know, not done enough for that. And, right, and but, I mean, the real issue, you think they're going to drag people away no, and put won't. them in camps? No. Please, stop it. Uh, Larry and Bartlett, you're on Chicago's Morning Answer. Hey, good morning, Amy. Good morning, John. Good morning. Um, John, uh, this isn't a complaint, but I have to be a little picky about your comment that world leaders didn't like Trump because he was crazy. Uh, I would say he was not crazy. They didn't like Trump because they knew what he said he was going to do, he yeah. would do. Yeah. If you look at what Obama did in the uh, the desert, he kept drawing red lines in the desert and back off yeah. and back off and back uh-huh. off. And then Trump told the Russians, you attack our base in Syria and I'll bomb the hell out of you. Yeah. And he killed 240 Russians. So that's why they were afraid of him. 
because he did what he promised to do. Yeah. And, and when I say he's crazy, I mean, they, that's, Larry. that's that, I mean, that's pretty much what I'm saying, that right. they knew that if Trump, they, they couldn't predict his movements and what he would do. And so that made that made them fear him. Mike and Elgin, you're on Chicago's Morning Answer. Good morning. Good morning, Amy and John. Good morning. Hey, I, I understand you played volleyball at Hersey. Did you play for Rim? Um, no, Rim came right after but I oh, was familiar did. with Rim. Yeah, because she played it. Well, oh. She coached at MacArthur when I was at River Trails. Right. If we want to go deep into the woods. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I oh, love okay. her. She's an amazing coach, and she did a, oh, she is. a wonderful she is. job. Yeah, I, I, I helped her out a few years when she actually went downstate in, uh, was it, 84 or 5 with Amy Pystrup or whatever from, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. But, but anyways. Uh, that was 88. Was calling, but, okay. yeah, was that 88? Yeah. yeah. But, uh the reason I called Amy is I wanted to convince you that Trump is, would be in his last term, and he can clean the clean it all out, clean the swamp out, fire everybody, you know, fire this stinking FBI director and the, you know, the head of what's his name from the DOJ. And I mean, he yeah, could clean it all out and not worry about having to get reelected. And then we'd have you know eight years with uh, DeSantis. So you know, I think that's the best of all worlds, you know, for, for him to do his last term and clean it out. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I'm I with him. You? I'm with no, him. No, you didn't. But, I mean, if he's the nominee, <laughs> of course I'm going to vote for him. Yeah. But the thing is, the people that don't like him are, are not going to like him. You right. know, it's just they're... Oh, they're, right. You're you never going to change so their what? minds. Yeah. Yeah. So what? You know, if if they don't like him, so what? He's... He's a hardball. DeSantis, we don't know what type of negotiator he is, though. You know what I mean? Because mm. Trump, you know, the art of negotiation, he, you know, writes the book, knows how to negotiate, and knows how to get one up on everybody when he negotiates. So, and, 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 right. Amy, I think that's a that's a great and valid point, because mm-hmm. DeSantis has the House and the Senate. He's never really had to negotiate like a Trump has, you know, because DeSantis can say, this is what I want, and he'll get it. Trump oh, right. has to go in there, and even with, like even with, even with a hostile media, hostile uh, House and Senate, he was still able to get stuff done. All right, let's go to Dennis and Edgewater. Good morning. You're on Chicago's Morning Answer. Good morning, Amy and John. Hey, hey Amy, I heard what you said. What you had to say about uh, Trump's idea about the homelessness and uh, typical Trump. You know, he he has a great idea, but maybe he hasn't flushed all of it out. I do <laughs> want to say though, I think he's he's not he's not wrong, and I'll tell you why. I volunteered volunteer twice a week at a soup kitchen in the uptown area. I have a son who's got mental health issues and is living in a care facility in the same vicinity. And I've seen the homelessness. I've actually helped a young man who's living under a a tent, in a tent, Mm -hmm. under one of the bridges there in the uh, uptown area. And he's not wrong. We need an aggressive action plan to get these people off the streets, to get them the care they need, to get them the support they need, and to just tolerate what's going on and say, well, we can't do what he's suggesting because it's not pretty or not doesn't sound nice doesn't look nice i think that's just as bad as doing nothing yeah which is what we're doing now yeah, so that's true. i, I, I mean... know he needs, to, he needs to flush it out more he needs to be a little, a little more specific and maybe you know uh, get some more other people giving him some ideas to build on that but we have to act we can no longer do this because 75 years if, when the hospitals were empty 75 percent of the people in illinois that were in those hospitals came to the uptown area that, oh, I know. So Who was your we, alderman got, Schiller? We, what was her name? Oh, I, can't I, I don't know. I, I've only I live in the I've lived in downtown Chicago now for four years, and uh, so I'm living it. I see it, and yeah. I, I don't think he's wrong. I think we have yeah. to have more hard conversations like this. All right, thanks, Dennis. Yeah, it's and then if you drive up Lakeshore Drive, yeah, oh, north of Irving, I mean, people are they're popping up tents everywhere. And, but you know, Amy, a, 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 a large portion of the homeless community want to be out there. I, know. I, I found no, I know. that I, hard I to believe. I volunteered at Catholic yeah. Charities Tuesday Night Supper for yeah. a year. And I met every, I mean, all these same guys for a year, every night, you know, once a week. Yeah. Um, I'd see them more than my mom, you know, because yeah. she lives out of state. And they had no desire. Like, why don't Responsibility. you? Responsibility. Know, we're giving you a voucher for three months yeah. free rent. Because no, I don't, yeah. they want their freedom. They don't want the responsibility yep. of having to live life. Nope. Because he's like, I'll get in there, and then I'll never be able to leave. I'm like, they're not going to lock you in. So it, that's a whole other subject. Let's quickly go to Rick and Joliet. You're on Chicago's My Morning Town. Answer. Good morning. Um, Amy, I, 
I don't know where to start with you, so I'm just going to try to keep it. Just be nice. Oh, wow. Out. You got my blood pressure on a little bit this morning, um, and I do intend to be respectful here. But, you know, this common uh, opinion of, you know, well, I like what he does, but I don't like him. This need, this cult of personality desire to find mm. a, a pretty Navy SEAL like Ron DeSantis, who I would also support myself, by the way, is completely contrary to the point that you are hiring somebody to do a job. And if you cannot see the job that needs to be done at the absolute destruction that's been done in a year and a half, I don't know what to tell you. But what you're doing here that the great, late, great Rush Limbaugh, God rest his soul, warned us against is you are allowing the opposition party and the media to choose your candidate. And if you don't think that the same people who did what they did to Trump, including people in his own party, are going to turn around and do the exact same thing to Ron DeSantis, you are A, living in a fantasy world on the political side, and again, B, if you can't see that we need a guy like Trump with a broom that big and a foot that big, as somebody else noted, for the last four years, or just to have a one-year, uh, four-year, one four-year term, to do everything it takes, to, to what John said, to, to clean up as much of this mess on both sides as necessary. Yeah. All right, thanks, you know, uh, uh, thanks Rick, Jesus. for the phone call. Appreciate your passion. You're listening to AM560, The Answer. Connect with Dan and Amy on the AM560, The Answer mobile app. Just text the word APP to 64636 to download the app today. Hey, business owners, are you wondering how to grow your business? Do you need cash flow and a ready source for financing? Well, Signature Bank can help. Hi, Mike Gallagher here to let you know that Signature Bank's loan decisions are made locally by a team who knows your name cares about your business, and is invested in your success. When you need advice about your business or even have a question, Signature Bank is there to help. There are no handoffs or call centers. This is a team that wants to get to know you and your business. That's why Signature Bank in Chicago is my bank. That's right. I'm a customer. When I call, someone picks up the phone on the other end. And with Signature Bank... I can securely bank anywhere, anytime. Reach out to my friends at Signature Bank. Call 773-467-5630. That's 773-467-5630. Or visit them online at SignatureBank.Bank. SignatureBank.Bank. Your business could be Signature Bank's next success story. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Will we get it? Good morning, Amy Jacobson here. John Anthony from Black and Right Radio, which is on Saturdays right here on AM560 from 12 to 3 p.m. Or have they changed that time? Still 12 to 3 all right. Yeah. How do you like in those three hours? Oh, I'm loving it. I know. I'm, I'm hearing great it. things. Yeah. I, I catch myself when I'm in the car. I'll, I turn you on. Oh, and I'm you. a nerd, a radio nerd, and I call in, and sometimes you guys don't take my call. <laughs> well, blame the, blame the technical Loser. producer. <laughs> I'll use a different name next time to see if I can Hey, that probably through. works. Yeah, but thank you so much for coming in today. Oh, and um, once again, I just had flashbacks yesterday. I, was, I watched the uh, press conference where... The Democratic Select Committee person who is deciding between four cities for the DNC next summer. Um, I had flashbacks to when we tried to get the Olympics. I had different flashbacks when we tried to get different things and our overlords just throwing themselves at this man, trying to get him, trying to convince him that Chicago is the place, you know, the safe place to have the DNC in the summer of 2024. Chicago. Some of you place. may recall the 1996 DNC was held here in Chicago with tremendous success. The convention sparked development around the United Center, leading to the restaurant shops and residences we see today in the West Loop and the Fulton Market uh, District where we are in right now. The 2024 DNC uh, convention has the same power to revitalize, um, and we are ready to harness that power. Uh, basically, we need the money. Uh, Mayor Life went on to say that it will bring in 150 to $200 million worth of revenue that week. <laughs> but are you ready for this? Because this, I heard this, and this made me laugh because I knew you and I were going to be working together. Uh -huh. Here's Congressman Danny Davis uh -oh. about why Illinois and Chicago 
should get the DNC convention over the other three cities, which, by the way, are uh, New York, Atlanta, or Houston. Are you ready for this, John Mm -hmm. Anthony? This is for you. Ready. Our state has managed the coronavirus as well and better than practically any state in the nation. (laughs) Our mayor has stood tall time and time again, promoting policies that say that America is the place where everybody can feel that they are in. (laughs) Do you agree with that? Tell that to the people who lost everything. Tell that, tell that to the losers that they picked out, that they chose. These people will not. I mean, guess what? We're still the only state in the Midwest oh. that's under a, a disaster declaration. For 31 months straight. Yeah. And so he's COVID. I mean, Prisker's saying we, we solved COVID. You know, I did a great job at COVID. Why? If you did such a good job, why are we still under an emergency order? Yeah. 312-642-5600. Turnkey.pro. Answer line 64636. Type in DA and then a quick comment. Should we have the Democratic National Convention here? Um, here's the here's the guy they're wooing, who they're throwing themselves at. His name is Mr. Harrison. Jamie. He's the site Jamie Harrison. Yes. Um, do you know him? I, I know of him. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is why we need to have a full blown show. Yeah, you know, President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, they didn't get a chance to have a regular convention. They didn't get a chance to have an inauguration. So this will be the first time in four years in which America will see Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and all of the things that they have accomplished and achieved and to hear their stories and why they deserve to go back to the White House for another four years. Why Democrats deserve to control the White House, the House, the Senate, (laughs) governor's mansions and state houses. Listen to these people. Guess what? Do you remember the difference between the Republican convention and the Democrat convention? Um, we kind of had people. We no, actually um, had we actually had a convention. We actually, yeah, it was. I mean, everything was drastically <clears throat> right. scaled down, but we did have people gathering for the like, you know, to vote. Yeah. But yeah, they didn't. I mean, they did. God, we think about Biden. I mean, he campaigned from his basement. He was not even yeah. out, and when he did come out, there'd be six or seven cars right. out in the parking lot. He, then he had a mask on, and he was talking to. I mean, it was just disgusting. But they did have, I mean, I I have heard Kamala's story. You have heard Kamala Harris's yeah, story. That she's a woman. And that, she, I mean, you hear, you, you know, Pritz, or not Pritzker, I mean, Biden, excuse me. They're trying to be one and the same. His story over and over again, you know, about corn pop and all that stuff. But, and here's, real quick, this is okay. a, a montage mashup of all the great comments Biden has made. <laughs> Uh, if I'm elected president, you're going to see the single most important thing that changes in America is we're going to cure cancer. Nothing is over until we decide it is. Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? That's why I and so damn many other people I grew up have cancer. What are you doing using your big school words? Just use normal people words and I'll understand what you're talking about. And Corn Pop was a bad dude. And he ran a bunch of bad boys. I'm eager to hear Nigger here next from my good friends. Smart man. The idea that an eight-year-old child or a ten-year-old child decides, you know, I decided I want to be transgender. That's what I think I'd like to be. It'll make my life a lot easier. There should be zero discrimination. I mean, it, he he's just a buffoon. This is making me actually want to run to Trump now. Hey, but, I um, mean, here's a question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jamie said all the things that, you know, the Democrats have accomplished. What is it? Tell I mean, name Wait, one wh- thing that they've accomplished. Name one. They're, they they can't. The destruction of one. America? Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, that is their goal. That is the progressive's goal. They and here, fundamentally fresh, transform America. They're doing it. Fresh, fresh from his COVID home stint. J.P. Pritzker, are you ready for this? Uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they represent, they are Chicago. Our great president and vice president, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, uh, they represent, the two of them, the diversity among them of the city of Chicago, just between the two of them. Uh, And what we have to show off is the neighborhoods and people of the city of Chicago to represent what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris represent. 312-642-5600, turnkey.pro, answer line 646 Three sick, 
type in DA, then a quick comment. Why wouldn't they choose somewhere where they're not Democrats, where right. they try to attract Democrats to their party? Right. Well, Chicago is the base, so, you know, <laughs> that's the base of yeah, all but, cheating. <laughs> well, that question was asked to <clears throat> Mr. Harrison. You know, I don't buy, I, I know many of the pundits often talk about, um, you know, the impact politically that it has on things. You know, we, we held a convention in Philadelphia and we didn't win Pennsylvania that year. We held a convention in Charlotte and we didn't win North Carolina that year, right? So bottom line is about the show. It's about putting on the best show possible on the ground, but also on television. Show. Painting the picture and demonstrating why, and it's about the story and why Democrats need to be in leadership. A show. Pageantry. Yeah. You know? We're the sash. Oh. This is why we're in it. For you know, this is this is Hollywood. We need a we need a big production. Oh. Uh, let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to oh Bob in Buffalo Grove. Good hey, morning, Bob. What up, Bobby? Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Amy and John. Good to hear you, John. Um, I'm going to date myself. Uh, you guys weren't born, but let's have a redo of uh, 1968 without the uh, all the assassinations. I remember that convention, and I had a college roommate that was involved in the protests. All we need to do is um, have Biden um, give a resignation or step down like Johnson did on uh, uh, March 31st, uh, 68. I remember that speech, too. And open it up, and let's see the uh, crazies come out. And back then, in 68, I was listening to WIND and uh, listening to... um, uh, Howard Miller, and he was um, talking about what was going to happen at the uh, convention and all the crazies that came into the town, uh, the hippies, the yippies, mm-hmm. and uh, they were going to uh, nominate a pig. And uh, it was it was something to, to live through, that convention. And, um, uh, and I, that, so I'm, I'm all for it. Bring it here and let's see what happens. Wow. Do you think it'd be crazier than 68, Bob? Um, well, it's going to be interesting. How K- K- Kicker is going to be, how will um, Mayor Lightfoot, if she's still um, mayor, that's the other big issue, how will um, she handle it? Because remember what uh, Daly, you weren't alive. What did Daly do? He brought out the police. And, um, Did he bring out the National Guard, too, and say, you know, not... Yeah, and it was just, uh, you know... Name? No, uh, no. What did he say? The oh, I was at the same. I'm trying to think. That was the famous speech where he said, the "Police are here not to create disorder, to pre- but to preserve disorder." Yes, 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 yes. Good job. I don't so, think yeah, it's going to happen though. I mean, the Democrats control the Demo- the Democrats control all of the, you know, the 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 instigators. So I don't. I they won't allow. They won't unleash their instigators on their own convention. Well, Mayor Lightfoot was asked. You know, will our police department be ready? I think we're all up for it. You know, I said earlier um, that we're ready for our close-up. Um, this is a great global city. Uh, we are ready um, to show all the proof points that support Biden and Harris, um, whether it's um, our work with organized labor, whether it's how we're using ARP dollars to strengthen communities. Um, the list goes on and on. And this is a place where we are going to be not only uniting Chicago and Illinois, but we have the opportunity to really ignite um, the entire uh, Midwest, from Minneapolis to Detroit, uh, from Madison, Milwaukee, down to St. Louis, and parts in between. This is a real opportunity to go right at the heartland. And, you know, my view is you win the heartland, you win the election. And we are ready. Now- I thought that there was talk, too, of Biden stepping down. Yeah. <laughs> and Kamala Harris having a different running mate. <laughs> like uh, somebody here? What? <laughs> somebody <laughs> Somebody that uh, resides here in Illinois. Yeah. Hey, you think they gave each other COVID? Oh, but Biden and yeah, Pritzker? they were. He was up there, right? Oh yeah, he was there. Who knows? He, he could have gotten in Saudi Arabia. Somebody could have walked by him and gone <coughs> and <laughs> trying to off him. Did you hear the comedian joke? No. Basically said if if COVID is is done, if it if it doesn't take out somebody like a Biden or. He said, "If it, it potency is completely done, you got to listen, listen to this comedian. I think it was, I, I'll find it for you and I'll send okay. it to you." But he said, "COVID has lost all viability." Oh my! Oh, good. Yeah. Are you glad you didn't get vaccinated? Of course. Oh. Still not. 
I'll play something for you later about the vaccine, unvaccinated. Oh, um, but this is now, this is because you used to be a state rep. Yeah. All right. So who's in charge of the DNC right now? Um, Jamie Harrison. Rob- and uh, up there, but right, here but in Illinois, it, it's Robin, Robin Kelly. Robin Kelly. Okay. So P- Pritzker, not a big fan of Robin Kelly. Never wanted yeah. her to be in charge. Yeah. So Marion Ahern, who is the stones of a girl. I mean, she's got stones. I love this woman. Listen to what? <laughs> Listen, because each reporter got one question, just one. And here's her question. Governor, can I ask you, because the mayor did talk about the unified leadership, and while Shia did refer to it, we'd like to get your comments. How can you say there's unified leadership when you're trying to boot Robin Kelly from her post? Well, let's be clear. We're all standing here in unison, standing up for a Democratic convention for Chicago and for the state of Illinois. And I think as the chair said so eloquently, um, after Saturday, we're gonna have a chair of the Democratic Party of Illinois. Whoever that is, is gonna serve a four year term. We're all rallying around the Democratic Party of Illinois. For yeah, I mean, but come on. Ouch. I mean, she was standing right behind him, too, and it was very uncomfortable. Ouch. <laughs> I love when things get uncomfortable. You're listening to Chicago's Morning Answer, Amy Jacobson and John Anthony, who's in for Dan Proft. It's like a hot, steaming cup of information to start your day. It's Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. See Dennis Prager at Cigar Night on Thursday, August 18th at the Humidor Cigar Lounge in Lyle. Tickets on sale now at 560theanswer.com slash cigar. Good Wednesday morning. Welcome back to Chicago's Morning Answer. Amy Jacobson here. John Anthony in for Dan Proft hey, for hey. today. So thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Uh, the war in Ukraine continues. It started February 24th. Remember at that time, everyone in Chicago put up their Ukrainian flags, the bumper stickers. I saw stickers on porta potties. I saw, you know, over overpasses that were filled with, you know, save Ukrainians. And then as time went on, you know, and then June came and those flags were replaced with the gay pride flag. And then mm-hmm. Jill, 4th of July came and those flags were replaced with the American flag. Some places. In some places, yeah. Well, okay. But I just don't know, you know, the public interest is waning as this war drags on. So with more on this and an expert on Putin, let's welcome to the program Philip Short, longtime foreign correspondent for the BBC, economist, London Times, and author of said book, Putin, the most comprehensive and detailed biography of the Russian leader to date. Good morning, Mr. Short. How are you? Good morning, Amy. Yes, so tell us... um, how long do you think that this is going to last, this invasion of Ukraine, and what is Putin's endgame? It's going to last quite a while. Um, I mean, that sounds a very trite thing to say, but it, it's absolutely unknowable. Um, Putin's hope is that the longer it goes on, uh, the more the West you talked to just now about interest beginning to wane and uh, the Ukrainian flags being replaced in places by other by other flags, um, that that's what he's reckoning on. Uh, that eventually, with inflation rising, energy costs high, gasoline uh, going, prices going through the the roof, um, uh, possibly in in Europe, uh, in the, the the developing world, there will be famine, there will be hunger, waves of migration. Um, All these things are going to put a lot of pressure, Putin hopes, on uh, Western Europe and on the United States, on the West generally. And we will, our resolution will waver. Now, a lot of, whether that happens or not, is going to depend on what happens in the battlefield as well. Um, And that is unknowable. Uh, The Ukrainians and the West say, we're going to win. The Russians say, we're going to win. We're just going to have to watch how it plays out. But I think we're talking about months and possibly a lot longer. Well, for those of us who, you know, don't refresh our memory, why does he want to capture Ukraine in the first place? Ukraine has been a fixation for Putin for years and years, ever since the 1990s. And it all started with, with Ukraine was the country which voted for independence and back in, in 1990, 1991. And the, um, that vote really was the final nail in the coffin of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union then broke up. And uh, Putin has, has never forgotten that. Um, Ukraine is uh, the biggest country alongside Russia. 
Um, it's very close in culture. It's a distinctive Slav nation. It's not Russian, but uh, it's very close in, in culture to the Russians. And uh, for Putin, it, it's, it's really important that uh, Ukraine be at least neutral. So that's one issue. But the other issue, which is actually even more important, is the relationship between Russia and the United States. Putin wants to neutralize Ukraine, but above all, he wants to show that the United States can't prevent Russia from doing that. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people forget that um, Putin um, poisoned the former uh, Ukrainian president, uh, Yushchenko, or however you pronounce his name. Um, you know, I, I look uh, at... Yes. I, 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 I've, I've been following this for, I mean, for quite some time since um, Russia and Putin and Ukraine. Now, you, you look at how... Russia invaded Ukraine. Do you believe this happens under a Trump administration? And if, let's say, Trump comes back to run again, you think the war ends quicker? Well, this is kind of what if, isn't it? Yeah. It's very speculative. Um, I'm going to pick you up on one thing. You say Putin poisoned Yushchenko, uh, the former Ukrainian president. The SBU, the Ukrainian Secret Service, did it. Okay. Um, they probably had some help from the Russians, um, but it, it was not Putin himself who kind of ordered the poisoning of Yushchenko. Uh, Yushchenko. Um, but, but to come back to Trump... Uh, it's very, very difficult to know. My, my feeling is that had Trump still been in power, we would, we would not be where we are now. Um, not so much because uh, um, Trump would have been kind of an easy pushover, but Trump was extremely unpredictable. And with Biden, P Putin thought he was dealing with a much more predictable administration, an administration which had just uh, left uh, pulled the last uh, soldiers out of Afghanistan in rather chaotic order, and which he thought was not going to react very strongly to uh, uh, Russia going into Ukraine. Trump, he, he couldn't have been sure how Trump would, would have reacted. So, yeah, it might have been different if Trump had still been in power. If, if Trump is re-elected, my goodness, well, everything's going to change, isn't it? But would it change for the better? <laughs> That depends on your politics in America. Yes. I, I'm not American. It's for you guys to judge whether it would be better or worse if Trump came back to power. I think a lot of Americans uh, would probably quarrel about one way or the other about that. Uh, your country is not really very, very um, in, in great agreement about uh, Trump and about politics generally. Right. But do you think Putin would, you know, if Trump was back in office, Putin would back down by any means? No, no, Our I don't think course. there's any question that Putin will back down. Um, and and this, is, this is wishful thinking. Uh, he has gone so far that he cannot afford to lose. Um, so uh, he's going to carry on. And the question earlier was how long is this going to last? He's going to carry on until he has something which he can present as a victory. And uh, you may say, well, what happens if the Ukrainians win? Yeah, if, if Ukraine um, does manage to push Russia, the Russian forces, right back to uh, the positions of before February 24, then we're into a whole different ballgame. But logically, I mean, looking at the military situation, it's rather hard at this stage to see that happening. Much more likely a war of attrition, which eventually finishes up largely frozen with neither side uh, able to get a decisive advantage. What are, is there anything to the rumors that Putin has cancer? No, I think Bill Burns had it absolutely right when he said he's, he's altogether too healthy. I mean, I've been, I've been watching Putin extremely carefully for the last 10 years, and he doesn't, I mean, he's older now, he's put on weight, he doesn't <laughs> work out as much as he used to. You know, he's nearly 70. But wow. there's absolutely no sign that his health has fundamentally changed or that he's following a very different schedule from what he did 10 years ago. If you're sick, you don't have loads of meetings, public meetings, uh, meetings with ministers, uh, you know, every day. Uh, and that's what Putin is doing. So, so, there, so what you're saying is there'll be no more 
uh, shirtless uh, riding on horses from Putin anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's got a bit old for that. He doesn't do the black slopes anymore yeah. or skiing either. Um, yeah, he, he is, he's changing, and his image is changing. Um, a terrible image in the West, but even in Russia, uh, where he still has a lot of support, uh, his image is kind of get, becoming more, more the father, grandfatherly figure of, of, of the, the head of state, yeah. rather than this macho image that he used to project. Now, what, 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 do, what, do, what do you think is, is, is motivating Putin? You think it was the, the fall and the collapse of the Soviet Union that's motivating him to return to what he thinks is preeminence of, of Russia, uh, of the USSR? Uh, what's his goal? What's the end game here? I think if you want if you want one key word, it's respect. Uh, it's not to re- you know to re- reconstruct the Soviet Union. I mean, he'd love to do that, but he knows it's impossible. Um, it's not to, to re- re-establish the Russian Empire, but it is. It's a little bit like Trump, you know, make America great again. It's not making Russia great again for Putin, but it's giving Russia back its pride and showing the rest of the world that Russia is a country that is to be respected. Um, that is his fundamental motivation. All right, Philip Short, thank you so much for joining us. Longtime foreign correspondent for the BBC, economist, London Times, and author of Putin, the most comprehensive and detailed biography of the Russian leader to date. Thank you so much, Mr. Short. Have a wonderful day. Gotta go get it. Thank you, Amy. You too. Bye. I think, and he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. This is Chicago's Morning Answer. Your show keeps me alive during the week. There's nobody I'd rather listen to between 5 and 9 in the morning than you guys. On AM 560, The Answer. All right, John Anthony. A year ago, our leaders all said the COVID shot would keep us from getting and spreading COVID. Remember that? <laughs> I do. And then guess what happened? They got COVID. <clears throat> Spread it, too. You're okay. You're not going You're not going to get COVID if you have it these vaccinations. Hey folks, guess you heard this morning I tested positive for COVID. And when people are vaccinated, they can feel safe that they are not going to get infected. Dr. Fauci says he has COVID again. If you've done the right thing and gotten vaccinated, you deserve the freedom to be safe from COVID-19. And this morning, I learned, I I tested positive for COVID-19 as well. With three doses that you've been prevented, not just from serious illness, but from getting this virus, this Omicron variant, and therefore giving it to others. Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews is in quarantine for seven days after testing positive to COVID. So I, I'm fully vaccinated. It gives me some comfort. Anthony Albanese has just tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, having received two doses of AstraZeneca, it's a very effective vaccine protection from symptomatic illness and therefore risk of transmission to others. Risk of transmission love to it. others. <laughs> That music so, was amazing. How are you feeling now, John Anthony? I, I'm doing great, unvaccinated, and still living life. I mean, what hypocrites Yeah, those yeah. world leaders were. Yeah. Just, you know, it was the pandemic of the unvaccinated. They shamed you. They made you feel you couldn't go into a restaurant. Yeah. You couldn't work out at a gym because you didn't have your car. There was, your life was put on hold for what? How long did that last? Three months? Yeah, it did. That stupidity in New York, it lasted almost a year. Yeah. So shame on that. But Justin Kosick said he wanted to ask me a question about the vaccine. So uh, Well, mine time. plays basically off of John Anthony right there is which group has more regrets right now, the vaccinated or the unvaccinated? <laughs> oh, 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 the, uh, the vaccinated, I'm sure. Uh, no. Absolutely. I, Did you yeah. hear about the, the ladies, men, uh, you know, what it, the cycle and how it's all uh, thousands? It's called the menstrual cycle. Well, I, I, yes. I, I, I was trying to be, you know, respectful, didn't know what I could or couldn't it's say. A, it's That's why I said cycle. doctor term. <laughs> It's the medical term, I should say. Yes, no, because I, I was a victim of that. Yeah. I have been, I've, I went through menopause years ago. And after my first COVID vaccine, full-blown period. Ooh, and I told my. Alex Berenson about that because he reached out on Twitter and was reaching out to different women. And he asked me about it. And I, you know, DM'd him back and told him what happened. Then I called my gynecologist and he said, yep, that's happening a lot. I said, well, then why are you supporting this and why are you promoting it? Ooh. Because, you know, why, why would that, that there's nothing in the world that, that would make that happen unless yeah. you've got something into your, you know, administered into your body that made that happen. So do you feel uncomfortable now, John, yeah, talking about this? No, I'm okay. Are you squirming a little bit? Yeah, a little bit, but that's okay. okay. 
Uh, yeah, okay. But, you know, um, people, and, but, but I will tell you this. The people that have not gotten vaccinated are yeah. the only ones that I know that do not have COVID right now. Yeah, you know why? Because natural immunity works. It really works. Deborah Burke said it, you know, she's, mm-hmm. you know, and she also said that, you know, we probably did push the vaccines a little bit too much. That's yeah. true. Hmm. Okay. We now you tell us. To do that. Before you see it on TV, share it on Facebook or read about it in the paper. Hear it here first. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. <laughs> This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Good Wednesday morning. Amy Jacobson here. John Anthony in for Dan Proft today, host of Black and Right Radio, which could be heard Saturdays right here on AM560 from noon to 3 o'clock. So you want to check that out. Yes. And something that I checked out the other day that has really has stayed with me, and I just wanted to share it because there's such a lack of respect for police officers, for military men and women who've served this country so proudly. It's a story about Keith Cooper, a 73-year-old Vietnam veteran, he was killed during a carjacking no. last summer, and his daughter wrote a note to his attackers, whom, by the way, one was a minor. They were both on electronic monitoring, so they're suing Cook County and said judges for letting them out on electronic monitoring, and they committed this heinous crime while on EM. So his daughter wrote this letter. On Wednesday, July 14th, you turned my world upside down. My dad was just on his way to pick up his prescription at CVS when you spotted him. He just wanted to get his medicine, get back in his car, and come pick me up. We had stuff to do that day. But one of you decided to grab his keys from his hand and demand his car. That's fine. You can have his car. He had insurance. We could have gotten him a new car. He asked you nicely to give him his keys back. The onlookers even asked you to give my dad his keys back. My dad didn't try to fight you or give you a hard time. Why didn't you just give him the keys back? Here's where everything got messed up. You couldn't get into the car. You dumb dumbs couldn't figure out how to use the key fob. You couldn't figure out how to just click the damn button. So out of frustration, you punched my dad in the head and pushed him in his chest. His heart is very fragile. He's had two heart surgeries in the past 10 years. And after all that, you ran. You ran. You blank and ran because you both are cowards. All my daddy wanted to do was pick up his damn medication, but you couldn't let him do that. And you were too stupid to figure out how to use a key fob. I'm going to pray for you. God can get you better than I can. Sincerely, Keith's baby girl. Uh. I mean, isn't that, that's just, but she's, I mean, I I didn't, I mean, I didn't know that that's why they punched him because I remember hearing about the story. Yeah. But I didn't know because they couldn't figure out how to use the key fob. Not too and bright. And so they punched him and killed him. Not too bright. So this world is going to hell in a handbag sometimes, but we have to keep the hope, right? God is good. You always tell me that. Yep, we text God is each good. other that, you and yeah, I, back God and forth good. when we're having those days. God is good. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's all I got. You right. know, he's good and he's greater, greater than anything, you know. That's how I feel it. So our next guest is, um, she's had to deal with, yeah. murder as well. Uh, Ann Dorn, her husband, retired police captain David Dorn, was killed by looters in St. Louis during the George Floyd, R- Floyd riots. And the good news is that somebody has been captured and has been convicted in this case. Yes, yeah, they have. And with that, we welcome her to the program. Good morning, Ann. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. Thank you. Good morning. So, Ann, Good morning, um, John. Yeah, I know that you were on John's shows last Saturday, which uh, and I appreciate him helping us out today. But we wanted to hear your story and just start by telling us about your husband. Um, David was a great man. He was um, in his mind. He was a superhero all his life. As a kid, he used to play Superman and superhero, and all he ever wanted to be was a superhero. And um, became a police officer, and. Um, you know, he loved doing his job. He loved taking care of people. And, you know, his career shows it. His career shows his soar up to being a captain. He he succeeded in everything he did, and um, he enjoyed doing it, and he excelled. And not only did he take care of his people, but he took care of his community as well, and everybody loved him. 
Yeah, and and you know what? And I I know you 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 still haven't watched the video of that tragic day, um, and no. I don't I don't blame you. I watched it, and and when I first saw it, I I literally cried when I first saw it. Um, now this person who I I, I will not say his name. This person has been mm-hmm. convicted. Uh, when is the uh, when when will he be sentenced? He'll be sentenced September thirteenth at ten a.m. Yeah, are you are they looking? Missouri still has the death penalty, correct? They do still have the death penalty. They're not seeking it. However, minimum sentence, I believe, is life in prison without parole just for the murder first charge. He has seven other pending charges. Good Lord. That's... Does he have a record, this 26-year-old? Yes. He um, he was charged with a robbery first, which is an armed robbery. Back in 2013, he was put on probation. In 2018, he violated the probation and committed a second armed robbery. Um and then um, in 2020, he committed a stealing, a felony stealing, while on probation again. So they wow. never gave him jail time. He just kept getting probation on top of probation on top of probation. Wow. And 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 yeah. Um, and you've started the um, Captain David um, Dorn Foundation. Um, talk to talk to us a little bit about that. What it, what the foundation uh, has done and continues to do for um, police that are continue that, that are serving now. Well, the uh, foundation is, is to carry on his name and his legacy of helping others. And we've decided to start this this foundation to help all first responders, um, police and fire and EMS, by buying them equipment, equipment that they would normally have to pay out of pocket for, um, that their uniform allowance or the department doesn't supply for them. So um, flashlights, gear bags, medic trauma kits, um, Eye and air protection. We bought boots for firemen. Um, the, the fire departments usually supply boots for them, but every two to three years is a cycle. And if they get destroyed in the meantime, they kind of just have to tape them up and deal with it. Now imagine, you know, Chicago and St. Louis in February fighting a fire standing in water, Ugh. you know, and the temperature's nine degrees outside and you got holes in your boots. Yeah. So, um, you know, these guys are in need. And um, if we can help them just a little bit, and save them some money. That's what we're going to do. And on top of that, we um, we have mental health providers that we know that we are connected with. We can get them help for mental health services for them and their families. And um, I even want to supply some service dogs for a few of them if possible. Well, good for you. God bless you for doing that. And again, where can people help? What website can we go to? Uh, the website is www.capt, which is cat, short for captain, David Dorn Foundation dot com, or they can find it on the Facebook page of uh, the Captain David Dorn Foundation. And and also, you 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 failed to mention that you're also on the radio, hitting heroes with Ann Dorn as well. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to let you get away without that. <laughs> yeah, I am on Hidden Heroes. Um, I I focus on the families and the people who stand behind first responders. I humanize our first responders and let people know, hey, their fathers, their mothers, their brothers, sisters. Yeah, and you know. Um, just yeah. make it real for people. Well, let's talk. Let's go back to that night of June second, twenty twenty, at Lee's Pawn and Jewelry. Mm-hmm. Your husband had an accomplished career, retired as a captain, mm-hmm. but he he didn't want it because you know some people miss the clown in the circus, and some people just yeah. miss the clowns or the circus, and some people miss both <laughs> when they retire. So he wanted to get back in the game, right? Well, he'd always helped Lee. Lee was a friend of his. Um, they've been friends for forty plus years. We lived about five minutes from Lee's. Um, business. Lee lived when he was in when he lived in town. He was a snowbird. When he lived in town, he was probably forty five minutes away. Mm-hmm. So anytime something would happen, um, Dave had keys, and if an alarm went off, Dave would respond. And it usually was a rodent, a rat had gotten in the building, or a thunderstorm mm-hmm. would set it off. This night we knew differently because of the riots happening in the city of St. Louis. But I had gone to bed, and because um, I had to be up early in the morning, we were working twelve hour shifts, and. Um, Apparently, he got a call around 2 a.m. that the building had been breached, and he responded. And they're thinking the police would be there um, because when the building's breached, the police respond. But um, obviously, the police weren't there when he got there, yeah. and he confronted the looters. Um, from what I found out in court, he did fire off two warning shots because it was so chaotic into the air. Mm-hmm. And he confronted a couple of them talking to them telling them not to leave the place, tell, talking to them, telling them they're just going to get some silver chains and some used TVs. And um, this young man came out of 
wherever he came from with the gun, uh, walked past him probably 20, 30 feet, turned around, kneeled, and fired at him wow. 10 times, striking him four times. Oh, he fired 10 rounds? Why? I mean, why? Did he, did he apologize in court? Or did he... No, he was very cold and callous in court. He showed actually no emotions whatsoever in court. Um, just cold, dead eyes, staring straight ahead, never looking at anybody, never acknowledging anybody in court. Did they put up what kind of defense? What did they say he was shooting himself? I mean, what what in the world did his defense? No, they say? they said he wasn't there. They said oh, he wasn't that was there. their they defense. Said, oh, yeah. There's no DNA or fingerprints to put him on scene, and since there's no DNA or fingerprints, then he couldn't have been there. You know, they're playing the CSI effect. Yeah. But, you know, they had a DNA specialist say, just because I'm standing in a room doesn't mean I'm going to leave DNA behind. Yeah. And, um, you know, you show him in a picture on Facebook. He was in a black outfit five days before holding two guns. And then uh, the was night of the meeting, he was made. Was one of the guns in the photo? So, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they believe so. And then, um, and then five days later, he's caught on camera inside the pawn shop wearing the exact same outfit with one oh, of the guns. Wow. And, and, you know, uh, I know that right after this happened, President Trump took, uh, brought you guys in. You, you spoke at the Republican yeah. National Convention. How was that? What, what was that experience like? And, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people talk, you know, negative about Trump. But how was how, how was Trump? Was um, he to you and your family? He was awesome. He was such a gentleman. He, um he was so kind and compassionate. He, somebody wrote up a dossier or he looked into Dave, but he knew everything about Dave's career and he read it. He knew Dave's career. He got to know who David was, you know, and then he and I talked for 20, 30 minutes. He called first. Well, he had someone call first to see if I would even talk to him, Would she talk to him. And my sister's like, of course she will. And, um, so when we, he and I talked, it was a, it was a very long conversation and Mm. what he didn't know, he wanted to know. He asked a lot of questions and he was just so kind and caring and asked, you know, if the kids are and I needed anything. And, and then he invited us to the white house and it was kind of funny how he invited us to the white house. It was about a month, not even a month after Dave died, he called and I'm home alone and I'm eating dinner and I get a phone call and it's just like, Hey, Anna, Donald, (laughs) like we're old buddies and friends. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's like, "Hey, Melania and I are having a garden party. You want to come?" Oh, that's so sweet. Now, did it anybody... wasn't. We're celebrating. It wasn't. We were celebrating the Fourth of July with hundreds of other people. It's like, <laughs> hey, we're just having a little get together at the house. You want to come over for our barbecue? Is what it sounded like. Oh, that's great. So you went, oh. right? And was it a? Oh, of course, affair? yes, yes. Oh. We went to the barbecue first um, before the RNC because um, the RNC was in August, and we went to this in. Um, in oh, July, so we went to the barbecue first. I didn't know that. It was 4th of July. Yeah, the 4th of July, we were there with um, several hundred people, and we got to sit on the lawn of the White House and watch the 4th of July fireworks. That's great. <laughs> and, and did guys, anybody, I, oh, did oh, anybody reach out to you from the Democratic side? No. No wow. one. Wow. Not one person. Never. <sighs> offer any condolences yeah. or anything? No, not even his friends. Not even the people he considered he considered friends called. Wow. And you have wow. a fundraiser coming up, right? For for the Captain David Dorn Foundation, right? I do. I have a um I have a dine and donate coming up um at the Texas Roadhouse on August eighteenth here in Arnold, Missouri. And uh, we're trying to get the other ones involved in the area because I think we have like four Texas Roadhouses here in the St. Louis area. So we're trying to um get all four of them involved. So right now we have one. And we're working on the other three to get them involved for a dine and donate on August 18th. So, and since the shooting happened um, and your husband was quickly and violently taken away, what are you doing to help yourself heal? Uh, a lot of friends and family. I'm giving back to the communities. Um, I still teach law enforcement. I still teach a lot of law enforcement officers, so I surround myself with them. And I've built a wellness program right now that I'm working on with the state of Florida. And I'm going to be... Um, help just continue to help other first responders and um that i think helping gets just gets me through Man, all not right. one democrat wow no uh, all right and dorn thank you so much for joining us and again if you want to help out it's captain david dorn foundation.com correct yes but captain is abbreviated c-a-p-t right. c-a-p-t captain david dorn foundation.com and thank you so much for joining us and uh spending time with us this thank morning. you Ann. thank you i appreciate it all right 
Take care. And she joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. You're listening to Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM 560. The Answer. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM560, The Answer. That music can only mean one thing. It's time for our weekly confab with Stephen Moore, noted economist. Hello, Mr. Moore. How are you? Hi, Amy. Good morning. I will not say the word. I will not say the our word today. I will not say the recession word. Yeah, I just did. So, yeah, you just did. Oh, because you know. Allowed to say that, right? Right. And John Anthony, by the way, is in for Dan Prof today. Just so you know. Hi, so. John. Hey, how's it going, buddy? Good to see you. Good to hear from awesome. you again. Well, when asked about the R word, uh, President Biden said this yesterday with Peter Ducey. President, we're getting GDP numbers on Thursday. How worried should Americans be that? We could be in a recession. We're not going to be in a recession, uh, in my view. Uh, we are, The employment rate is still one of the lowest we've had in history. It's in the 3.6 area. Uh, we still find ourselves with people investing. Uh, my, my hope is we go from this rapid growth to steady growth. And uh, so see, we'll see some coming down. But I don't think we're going to, uh, God willing, I don't think we're going to see a recession. Is hope a strategy right now, Stephen Moore? Well, first of all, it's really kind of interesting because on Sunday, the uh, the, the White House minions went on all the talk shows and said, oh, recession. No, we're not in a recession. No, 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 we're not in a recession. Uh, recession isn't two, two straight quarters of GDP growth. Well, you know, just look it up in the dictionary. I mean, the, the dictionary definition of recession for the last 50 years has been, you know, two straight quarters of, of a negative economic growth. Now, we, we, we get the number officially 8.30 tomorrow morning, uh, okay. Eastern time, so 7.30 your time. And so we'll have the official readout. Uh, I think it's likely that it's going to be negative, although it could be slightly positive. But it, uh, most of the forecasts are it's going to be between negative one and negative two percent. And that means after the first quarter, which was negative, if my math is right, that's two straight quarters of negative growth. But what's so interesting is how they're trying to change the definition of things. You know, they, this is what the left does, uh, you know, so uh, effectively now. So if you remember, uh, the, uh, remember the term um, a transitory, you know, that they right. redefine the word transitory. Then, then remember, oh, here's one, mostly peaceful. Right. <laughs> As in mostly peaceful. Riots. As the b- building then, behind oh, them is burning. One. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, here's another one. Um, I don't know. Do you know what the definition of, uh, of uh, Amy, of a woman is? Because I think right. uh, people are confused about what a woman is these days. I mean, it could go on and on and on. But look, the, it doesn't matter what the kind of textbook definition of a recession is when you've got 80 percent of americans who say the economy is headed in the wrong direction and which are worse than any, even jimmy carter numbers and when you have um nine to ten percent inflation people are really having to cut back even on their essentials uh you know food and energy that's a recession for people right people have to make choices and you know how i compare everything to that big box of goldfish so remember when we first started doing this, uh, oh, the yeah. big box oh, yeah. of goldfish? Because that's a that's a staple yeah. for any mom with kids. All the kids they, they yeah. have goldfish, <laughs> and if you own a right. minivan, you'll find them in your car even ten years later. But when, when we started this, <laughs> three three dollars and ninety eight cents. Guess how much it was last week at the jewels? Three ninety eight. Wow. Eleven dollars and twelve cents. I took a picture what? of it. I was in shock. I'm Wait, like, how did that go from three ninety eight? Now at Walmart, somebody texted me a picture because I tweet this out. They're for eight ninety nine, and okay, that's on sale. Borrow, but they're eleven double this Walmart. <laughs> yeah, Amazing. but I, I mean that's some scary stuff because that's what moms use to feed their kids. You know, snacks are so important. And we found out from our good mm-hmm. friends over there at the well, Bruce Hill is the author of this article that the average Illinoisan needed a pay raise of $5,920 to keep up with inflation during the past 12 months. Wow. Well, so that's this... exactly right. And so, and, they, and, and by the way, I, I don't think most people did get pay raises of $6,000 last, uh, you know, last year. So th- this is the biggest problem with inflation is that people's paychecks are not keeping pace with the increase in the cost of buying things. So what that really means 
is people are getting poorer. And I love the White House saying, oh, we've done so much. They're talking about this, quote, equitable recovery. That was the uh, term that they used yesterday. Well, what's equitable about this? The people are getting crushed by the uh, inflation, as you were just saying, Amy, are you know, working class folks, people with, with lower incomes, who when they have to pay more money for milk yeah. and for gasoline and for broccoli and the things they have to buy, that that is like a tax yeah. and they're getting crushed by it. So I, I, it feels like the White House is living in, you know, never, never land where they're not even in touch with the reality of what's going on in Main Street USA. Yeah. And, and I had to pay 13, 14 dollars for a, a pound of um, ground beef the other day. What? <laughs> 14 bucks for a ground, a pound of ground beef. I mean, it, it's getting it everywhere. No, no, no. That's just that's those are the prices right now. You know, yeah, um, Steven, yeah. I got a question for you. I, I, as you know, um, Illinois governor, he just re-signed another disaster declaration. Here's my question. Have the COVID funds run out yet? And I mean, is, is, are they signing? <laughs> it's, is he signing this declaration because there's more money uh, that can be sent to the state of Illinois? Well, uh, I don't know what your situation is in Illinois with respect to how much money is left from your COVID funds, but how, how in the world is are they declaring uh, a, an emergency on COVID? Come on. Yeah. I mean, Lollapalooza this just week. Had a, Lollapalooza. Just had a People are coming from all over the world. What's that? I said we have Lollapalooza this week and people coming from all over the world and there's an emergency declaration. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, here's the point. that We, we, we just had a 77-year-old man who has asthma who, who got COVID. And all the White House said, oh, no, he's fine. Don't worry about it. Look, if somebody with two comorbidities, uh, uh, you know, advanced age and asthma does, isn't having a problem with this, this is just, a, a, you know, a, a cold, the common cold. You know, it's a summer cold. Now, that's not the case in every instance, but the idea that we're going to start shutting down things and declaring emergencies for this, I mean, it's like the left, they want to shut down things every chance that they get. Are we, every time we get the uh, uh, flu virus, are we going to shut down our economy again? I know. And in San Diego School District, 11 people are in the hospital out of 1.4 million people, and they're remasking kids in their summer school. It, and teach and the teachers and, too. You know, for eleven hospitalizations. Way, yeah, I know it's ridiculous. Here's the thing, that and by the way, that this you know, when you talk to people in the hospitals, they say that the the reason the person is in the hospital is not because of COVID. I mean, right. in other words, let's say you break your arm and then they take your temperature and say you've got COVID. You're not in the hospital because you have COVID. You're in the hospital because you broke your arm. Yeah, but and they test everybody. Everybody who enters the hospital has to be tested. It doesn't matter what you're there for. That's right. Exactly. So a lot of these, when you read these statistics that you were just citing, they're overestimating how many people are really having major health problems because of COVID. I mean, I just think people are are tired of it. I think people want to get on with their lives. I think, you know, obviously people should be safe and, you you know, you don't want to be, you want to wash your hands and and be involved in good health habits. But Did you just tell me to wash my hands? Yes. Please wash your hands, Amy. I know that you know. My my wife tells me that like six times. Did you wash your hands? I'm I'm sixty two years old. My wife's still saying, "Did you did you wash your hands?" I'm, I'm not twelve anymore, but uh, you know, just basic hygiene is is a good way to keep yourself healthy. But this idea, you know, I think look, people want to wear masks. I don't have a problem with that. Me neither. You know, I, I, well, the other day we're down at the park out in the middle of the wilderness, and this woman's wearing a mask. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, if the people want to do that, but I, I'm worried about all the mandates and requirements and shutdowns again, because boy, those who really hurt our economy. Well, LA County is going to, they're right on the cusp of just, dis- you know, declaring mandatory masks for indoor use and in large crowds outside. But last night, Beverly Hills, their city council, don't you know, they voted unanimously not to enforce it if it comes back. So now people are starting to push back uh, a little, which is a good yeah. sign. There is. And, and, you know, by the way, sometimes when people are wearing masks, uh, that that may be that they were tested positive themselves. And so I appreciate that. You know, if, if you're if you're contagious, then it's a good thing if you're wearing a mask. But look, my only point is I hope we've learned some of the lessons from COVID. The lockdowns, the shutdowns did not work. They did right. not sh- uh, slow the transmission of the disease. And I never actually answered your question, John, about whether uh, the 
they're doing this because they can get more money. Yeah. And I'm going to look into that because you might be right because Illinois needs money, right? Yeah. So they they may think, oh, we'll declare an emergency. We'll get more money from Washington. Right. Oh, I'm sure that's I, what's I, behind I, it. Here's a question for you, Mr. Moore. Uh, after Trump being in D.C., you think he's um, running again in 2024? I hope so. <laughs> As a Republican, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, what's, what's really, you know who I really hope runs for president in the Ooh. Democratic side? J.B. Pritzker. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love, I mean, yeah, throw me in that. <sighs> I mean, I, we're actually hearing some chatter about J.B. Pritzker, the worst governor in America. Well, maybe not the worst, the second worst governor yeah. in America. He's going he's gonna to do for America what he's done for Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> or he's going to do for America what he's done for Chicago. Well, he's I funding mean, everything. On, I would, He's the money What's bags. That? He's the money bags right now for the Democrat Party. Yeah, he is. I mean, all he does, is, you know, that's exactly right. And all they care about is, you know, the cha-ching, cha-ching. But, um, you know, I love this. How about this ticket for the Democrats for 2024? Uh, Gavin Newsom and J.B. Christopher. The two I know. That's, I know. And we'll everything, will, everything will be shut down forever. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I'll be huddled in our houses, you know, in the fetal position in the corner of the room. I mean, so come on. But uh, by the way, speaking of governors, I was just out in uh, Florida for the Sunshine Summit. I was the lunch speaker for the for uh, for uh, Governor DeSantis. My gosh, I mean, Florida is just absolutely doing incredible stuff. And I think, you know, I'd love to see that. Let's put Pritzker against uh against uh, Ron DeSantis. Yes. See what the voters want. Well, no, but if you had a choice, though, between Trump and DeSantis, I mean, who would you choose? Where does your loyalties lie? The top one. I know. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm undecided. I like them both. And look, I, I, I know people are disturbed by Trump's antics and behavior, and I'm not, I'm not happy with what happened on January 6th. But I got to tell you this: every day that Joe Biden is in president and see yeah. what he's doing to the economy. I think, you know, more and more people saying, you know what? Trump was awfully good on the economy, wasn't he? I said, yeah, he sure was. Maybe I didn't like some of the crazy things he said, but on the policies, yeah. And, and it's not only, I know we're running out of time, but you've seen they keep drawing down more and more oil from our Yeah, yeah. I was going to oh, tell you that. Run out. Waking up we're this morning, yeah. Reuters saying the Biden administration said it's going to sell an additional 20 million barrels of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Who Who's buying this oil? Do we know? Who's, well, Which foreign it's, country? It's stockpiled. Oh, oh, China is. <laughs> China is. And 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 here's the thing. Uh, this is you know we're we're moving into August. August is of course everyone knows is the hurricane season, especially in the southern states and in the Gulf states. But what if we get uh, one of those hurricanes that comes in and takes out one of our major refineries or takes out Oof. one of our major drilling platforms? Um, then we're going to go to the you know the reserve because that's why we have a reserve for natural disasters like that, and we're not going to have any oil left. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to go to the cupboard; it's going to be there <laughs> because they keep drawing it down uh, for a non-emergency uh, because we're not drilling it here at home. I mean, it, this none of this makes any sense to a rational person. Yeah, Stephen, I got a fix for the Trump DeSantis thing. Trump DeSantis, twenty twenty four, in the story. Oh my gosh, that'd be a great ticket. That would be a heck of a ticket, the best governor in America and one of our best recent presidents. I mean, I love that. I mean, the question is whether people can forgive Trump for his crazy behavior on January 6th. And, um, you know, we'll see. But I got to tell you, I mean, when you just look at the policies, folks, put aside his antics. When you look at what would happen in America, how we, you know, we rebuilt the economy, we we have big wage gains, the lowest poverty rate ever, lowest unemployment rate ever, that those were good times and they're looking looking good compared to where we are today. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make your prediction. I think we will be tomorrow, this time tomorrow, we will be officially in a recession. And the question is whether we can get out of it. And the first way to get out of it is to get rid of this president. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. Stephen Moore, thank you so much. Noted economist and author of Trumponomics. Also, most recently, Govzilla, how the relentless growth of government is devouring our economy and our freedom. Thanks, Stephen. Bye, guys. Take care. Take care. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. If you're talking about it, Dan and Amy are talking about it. It's Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer.
Good morning, Amy Jacobson here, John Anthony, and for Dan Proft, and thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Having I a good hope time. you're having a good time and an informational and informative time as yes, well. Yes, of course. I'm just scared of the monkeys that are attacking people. <laughs> yeah, what, are, what you were telling me that during the break. What's going on? 58 people in Japan have been attacked by biting, clawing by monkeys in Japan. 58 since July 8th. 58? Yeah. All right, should we worry about it here? Dun, dun, dun. Uh-oh. Hey, they we may always travel. Have to, we always have to worry about something. So Mayor Lightfoot unveiled her new plan to try and keep the Chicago Bears, you know, in Chicago because it's been that bad under her watch that she even lost the Bears. And her plan is to put a dome or partial dome over Soldier Field at a cost of $220 million, I believe it is. Who's going to pay for it? This is an incredible asset. Been here for almost 100 years. One way or the other, we have to invest in Soldier Field. I'm sorry, excuse me, $2 billion? $2 billion, that's what it is. Well, I don't want to speculate and get ahead of ourselves, but we believe in collaboration and shared uh, value and, and investment. That was her response, is who's going to pay for it? Basically, the taxpayers are going to pay for it. Because remember, 20 years ago, taxpayers coughed up $400 million to renovate Soldier Field, and it really didn't do much. I mean, you know, it's still the smallest stadium in all of the NFL and it still doesn't have a dome. So we're not going to ever get the Super Bowl or NCAA final four or any of that good stuff unless she puts a dome on it. Now, naming rights, that's a problem because uh, former Illinois governor Pat Quinn yesterday launched a drive to prevent the renaming of Soldier Field. And we dedicate something to the memory of service members who gave their last full measure of devotion to our democracy. We don't change the name. So what would you do with that? We're asking Paul Vallis, who is running for mayor of Chicago, former superintendent of the Bridgeport Public Schools and the Recovery School District of Louisiana, former CEO of both the School District of Philadelphia and Chicago Public Schools, and again, candidate for mayor. Good, uh, good morning, Mr. Vallis. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. So, it's good to know that we're really focusing on these really critically important issues. I, obviously, since we've addressed the issues of violent crime in Chicago, and of course, uh, since we provide such quality school choices, and since the mayor has gotten our property taxes and sales taxes under such control, it's so nice we can spend time on these type of things, isn't it? I know. I mean, was it the putting a dome over Soldier Field two days ago yesterday? Oh, was know bringing the Democratic National Convention to Chicago. She's doing everything but what she is supposed to be doing, which is to be reducing crime, making safe schools, making effective schools, and lowering our property taxes. And it sounds like we're going in the opposite direction. Well, let me make a couple points about the Bears. The Bears had over three years to work with the Bears to develop a plan to uh, address their needs without imposing additional obligations on the taxpayers, because as you know, we're going to continue to, to pay for the cost of the first stadium renovation uh, long after the Bears depart. Uh, I believe the Bears are gone. I don't think they're coming back. And her plan to renovate Soldier's Field, regardless of whether or not the Bears stay, and she's talked about spending upwards to $2.2 billion for this massive stadium makeover that that will then have a stadium anchored by a soccer team? I mean, please, are we serious? I mean, are we operating in the real world? It's interesting. Uh, she said, of course, that um, if the Bears leave, she'll work to bring a second NFL team to uh, Chicago. First of all, you know, the NFL is a very, very close club. And they decide, you know, the NFL um, – uh, oligarchs decide where they're going to go, and, and and they would never allow a second team to be located in Chicago. I think bringing a second NFL team stands about as uh, stands a better, uh, you know, Putin leaving the Ukraine and Crimea, Crimea simultaneously probably stands a better chance than uh, the NFL allowing a second team to come to Chicago. So she's in over her skis, and she has always been, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, 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 look, you know, talking about $2.2 billion stadium renovations, when the city's going to face a post-COVID financial crisis, when we still haven't addressed the issue of how we're going to fund our pensions, 
and when we have a police department that has been significantly degraded, uh, and you see it in the escalating violent crime, I mean, it's this is just a big diversion. So what would be your first task when you're elected mayor? Because well, it's a juggernaut, and a lot of people wonder why you're even doing it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, there are a number of things that you can do very quickly. With respect to the Chicago Police Department, I would do three things immediately. I would fire Brown and his leadership team and promote officers who are respected from within. That would be needed as a first step to restore confidence because, as you know, uh, close to uh, 1,700 police officers have left just in the last 18 months alone. I would then return to this concept of community-based policing where you push the officers down to the local police beat so every police beat is covered. And then I would restore proactive policing, which in effect means we want the police officers to arrest people who are committing crimes. And that's not what we're doing. There's been a 70 percent reduction uh, in arrests in the la- over the last two years alone. And, you know, CW or uh, Wirepoints came out with a report that said that the police were only able to have cars available for something like 50 percent of the high priority 911 cases last year. And, and so that's a, you know, that's a prescription for catastrophe. Uh, on the other hand, on the school side, I would get the schools in the game of playing a role, uh, a public safety role too. And that would entail us keeping school campuses open three days, uh, through the evening hours, six days a week, uh, obviously on the holidays and, and through the summer days. I mean, there's 600 school campuses. I know I built 78 of those schools and I built 125 campus parks around schools, and there's no reason why those buildings should be closed at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and closed on weekends and obviously closed through the bulk of the summer. You can easily bring uh, community-based activities, uh, recreational activities, enrichment activities to the school campuses to give the children a safe place to go. And for the high school students, I would reintroduce this concept of work study, paid work study, that would allow the high school students to, uh, to um, um, get involved in work, uh, high school-based work study jobs. Crystal Ray does it. The city could have every single uh, agency uh, under its control, as well as uh, businesses that get heavily subsidized by the city. They could invite the labor unions to create work study jobs that the district could then subsidize. And that would get tens of thousands of kids off the street Keep them off the street to keep them involved in the best the best environment uh, young people can be, particularly teenagers, and that's uh, in an environment where they're surrounded by working men and women. I think these things can be done. They can be done quickly. They can be done unilaterally, and, and I think they would that they would significantly that they would really help us um, uh, not only address the underlying conditions that contribute to crime, but also give the police the capacity to keep us, a greater capacity to keep us safe. Yeah, and Paul, I, I also think that consent decree needs to be relooked at. I think I think that consent decree is is has handcuffed policing in the city of Chicago um, so much. Uh, I, I, I would hope that someone would really go back and look at that and, and, and challenge parts of it because I, and when you look at how, how it was crafted, you know, who it was crafted for, I, I really believe that needs to be looked at. And, and I, I know many police officers who feel the same way. But, you know, both Brown and Carter, they have not been telling the commanders that they have no control over things, that the, the entire police department uh, is being governed by the consent decree. The consent decree didn't give us incompetent leadership. Correct. The consent decree did not strip the local police, uh, the local police uh, uh, beats of, of um, their needed police officers. The consent decree uh, did not uh, put police officers on these horrendous, horrendous, sometimes 10, 20, 30 day uh, yeah. work, uh, consecutive work schedules uh, without a, 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 a day off or, or put uh, perhaps police officers at the last minute be told that they have to work 12 hour days. And, and the consent decree has not kept the city from, from creating a witness protection program. Yeah, there is no program to protect witnesses or victims. So there's a lot of things that can be done uh, separate from the consent decree that would uh, improve the situation. Just reversing some of the really dumb things That's that the true. police department. Has no done. pursuit policy. 
Yeah, no foot pursuit, oh, no, no, pursuit. no yeah. car pursuits. There's no pursuits. I mean, no, so well, how are you going to no catch them? Pursuit. Yeah, but, you know, Amy, the, the, the rules and regulations, I know I come from a, a family of uh, police officers. My, both my sons were police officers. One is a firefighter. My wife was a police officer. And there are so many rules and regulations that you have to consider before you initiate a pursuit. And there's all sorts of rules and regulations that you have to follow that trigger the ending of a pursuit. Who in their right mind would would even want to chase somebody yeah. when if, if you don't follow any number of these steps, you can actually be disciplined and reprimanded. So at the end of the day, there's so many things that simply can be done unilaterally and quickly. And it really has to begin with the replacement of Brown and his leadership. Team. Yeah, and, I can't. And, 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 Amy, I can't believe you guys didn't mention NASCAR coming to Chicago, though. Oh, well, well, you know, listen, why should we worry about the Bears uh, departing when we, have, uh, when we have NASCAR coming? Just think about that. I mean, what a vision for the city. Daniel Burnham, of course, is the architect of everything good that the lakefront has become. It has probably turned over into his, in, in his grave multiple times. Uh, first of all, building that stadium and now putting a retractable roof in the first place. And now, of course, NASCAR. I mean, what an – I mean, just, just – but she did it without any input from the alderman. I mean, is that legal? They don't even know in the alderman that that the well, the alderman whose racetrack is in their ward. You know, they're like, well, what's in it for us, and how much revenue is it generating? Generating, and she left them all in the dark. Well, look, I, I mean, you know, they complain that they're leaving her in the dark, yet they continue to vote to ratify or to vote or to support her uh, on almost every single issue. A case in point, Alderman Beal was 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 uh, trying to get the speed, you know, the uh, uh, oh, the speed, speed camera, yeah, it's, yeah r- r- raised back to ten miles an hour instead of six miles an hour. They wrote more speed camera tickets last year, two point eight million than they have city residents, and and that was defeated. The aldermen, the local aldermen, both Hopkins and and Riley, screamed bloody murder over the decision. To uh, uh, you know, o- over the casino selection site, uh, but yet that was ratified with what four dissenting votes, five dissenting votes. So oh. they can complain all they want, but um, that compl- those, those complaints ha- have to be have to be translated into legislative action. And the city council continues to ratify our budgets. They continue to do, to do nothing on the public safety side, uh, and they continue to be uh, you know the, to follow her dictates. And yeah, there may be. A few more dissenting votes than usual, but at the end of the day, I don't know. I don't know if she's had a single ordinance defeated so far, and every ordinance that's emerging from the council that she's that, that she's decided to block, she's been able to su- successfully do so. So, so the council has to stand up. Yeah. But what do you, what what does school look like in the fall? I mean, we're less than a month away. On um, the last press conference I went to with uh, CEO Martinez and Mayor Lightfoot, they both said. We, we need to have, you know, our kids need to be in the classroom, show up for the first day of school, blah, blah, blah. But then turn around and say, but if they're not vaccinated and they've been there and there's an exposure, they have to be quarantined for five days. So what, when the heck is this? Is this ever going to end? It'll end when we have a new mayor, uh, quite frankly, because, uh, I mean, it, it's amazing. You know, the, uh, um, the uh, um, National Education Association had a conference um, I think it was in the state, I think in July, and they spent most of the time. They weren't talking about what the schools are going to do to make up for the lost instructional time that has done serious damage to children's academic uh, levels and, uh, or what they're going to do to get the schools involved in keeping children safe. No, they wanted to talk about the importance of continuing to be on guard and to be prepared and to, have, to continue to follow these kind of COVID safety uh, procedures and COVID mitigations, which is really a buzzword for, to, for doing what you said, being prepared to go remote, being prepared to force the kids to mask again. So, they're, I mean, they're not focusing on what's important. The taxpayers need to bear in mind that we're spending $9.4 billion on a school system, the equivalent uh, to, up to $28,000 a kid, and, 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 and it is a system that offers fewer and fewer choices and only one in six children in the Chicago public schools based on the most recent preliminary test scores are uh, meeting state standards. Of course, the union, as an answer to that, 
stop testing the kids. Right. Don't test them so we don't know. Bury our heads That's in right. the sand. All right, Paul, we're going to have to leave it there for today. Where can people get more information about your campaign? Uh, people can reach me on my uh, website, Paul Vallis, V as in Victor, A L L A S, 2023.com. Paul Vallis, 2023.com. Paul Vallis, always a pleasure. And uh, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Paul. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. This is the morning show. More Chicago radio listeners are choosing. This is Chicago's morning answer on AM560. The answer. America First with Sebastian Gorka. Today at 3, right before Sean Thompson at 4 on AM560. The answer. All right, good Wednesday morning. Amy Jacobson here, John Anthony, and for Dan Proft. Hey, you hey. can listen to John Anthony every Saturday from noon to 3 on Black and White Radio here on AM560. So thanks for joining us. And I don't know if thanks you've heard me. about monkey pox. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, w- the WHO uh, has declared monkey pox a global health emergency. So, so get this. Last week we had 1,400 cases in the United States. And all of the United States, what, what, 330 million people? Yeah. And now that jumped to 35K. So I'm not 35, I'm sorry, 3,000 in our entire country. And I don't understand why it's a, you know, a global health emergency. But now we have a new face. Yeah. The CDC has assigned Dr. Jennifer McQuiston to be, you know, the Dr. Fauci, Fauci's, you know, HIV, Fauci's COVID. And Dr. Uh. McQuiston is now in charge of monkeypox. Right now we have over 300 people who are working on this response 24/7. And you know, they just they can't keep up because they think the numbers are going to double every week and double and double and double. And why is this happening? We're coming out of COVID, right? It's been 2 years of people not traveling, not attending parties, not having fun, and I think there's some amplification of this that's happened as a result of people going out um, living their lives. Oh, and they're living their lives because we had a doctor on John <laughs> a few weeks ago who said well, this all started with a male orgy in Belgium, oh. and that's how this started spreading. But it's not just, you know, the gay community. Other people are getting it. Somebody has lesions inside their mouth or throat. They could um, potentially shed virus. There are only so many staff members at CDC. So when we stood up the monkeypox response, we had to pull people out of COVID. But the difference is they have a vaccine for it. I right. see you grabbing your mouth like, oh but it's mostly, you know, in the gay community. But if you have an s- open lesion or a sore and you lay down or use a towel and then somebody else uses that towel, the likelihood of getting monkeypox is high. That's why two kids out of 3,000 in the United States have monkeypox. It's from their parents or whoever, yeah. birthing person, kidding, or mom or dad, <laughs> dad or dad. Oh, boy. Um, using, you know, sharing linens and towels. So that's the thing. But guess what we have to do, John? What's that? we got to flatten the curve. Uh-oh. We'd like to see the curve not keep going up, oh. but flatten out and then eventually oh. start to go down. So that would be my hope in the next three to six months. And that's realistic if people take precautions now. Yes. <laughs> These people, I'm telling you, if, if you fall for it, America, on shame on you. Uh, for more on this and everything else going on in the world, let's welcome back our good friend, Ed Morrissey, senior editor for HotAir.com. Good morning, Ed. How are you? Good morning, Amy and John. Hey. Thanks for having me on today. Good. So I don't know if you've written about uh, monkeypox, but h- how is it declared? And do how do like people are not even buying into this if there's only three thousand people in the United States that have monkeypox? Uh, yeah, you know this is one of those one of those things that I think is more about making sure that you've got funding going to the right agencies than it is about a real public health emergency. You know, monkeypox, like you said, there's vaccines for monkeypox. People who were inoculated against the smallpox vaccine are against smallpox, you know, myself included because I'm old. And <laughs> I was one of the people that was inoculated against smallpox, have already have, um, you know, antibodies and protection immunity against it. Uh, so this is this this isn't AIDS. This isn't COVID. This is, you know, a, a manageable issue that is really centered in some certain specific behaviors. This isn't an aerosolized respiratory illness. This is, this is a direct contact type of illness that can be controlled. And so I think the idea that you're going to create a global health emergency over monkeypox is um, more, of a, more of a function of bureaucrats trying to 
uh, rationalize uh, demands for more funding. Oh, it's always about the money, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, always. yes. All right, so another thing that happened last night, uh, Merrick Garland sat down with Lester Holt, and uh, there is a possibility that Trump now may be a target in the GO- DOJ's criminal probe. Here's part of that interview. You said in no uncertain terms the other day that no one is above the law. That said, um, the indictment of a former president, of a perhaps candidate for president, would arguably tear the country apart. Is that your concern as you make your decision down the road here? Do you have to think about things like that? Look, we pursue justice without fear or favor. We intend to hold everyone, anyone, who was criminally responsible for the events surrounding January 6th for any attempt to interfere with the lawful transfer of power from one administration to another. So what does that sound like to you, that there is going to be a criminal investigation or there's not going to be one? Well, I think we know that there's a criminal investigation. The Department of Justice has kind of made that clear. The question is, what's its scope and who are its right. targets? The Washington Post had an article that came out last night you know, it was sort of like a, this blockbuster report. Washington Post is saying that the DOJ is looking into Donald Trump's actions and and uh, communications in regards to its January 6 um, investigation. I think mostly focusing on the whole fake electors thing, but that doesn't even say that he's actually a target. Um, if you're going to be investigating targets like Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman, you're necessarily going to have to know what the president was writing and saying about it at the time. So. I'm not necessarily sure that this was a big, huge development. Um, and and I am still not really convinced that this is the direction that they're going to wind up going, because I think the potential for backfire here is higher than the potential for um, success. You know, the, the um, what Garland said last night, just, just to address what Garland said last night, I mean, technically speaking, that's his role. His role is not to play, is not to make a political decision about this. His role is to do investigations. Now, I don't think that DOJ <laughs> is a political by any stretch of the imagination, but at least that's what they're supposed to be. Uh, it's really up to the president to make a call as to whether or not you're going to do, uh, you're going to take that turn. And I don't know that the Bidens are going to be terribly anxious to set the set the precedent that it's open season on your predecessor. <laughs> you've got the Hunter Biden stuff going on. Right. You've got the whole Biden Incorporated stuff going on when you're, when there's now some evidence of, you know, stuff going back to the big guy. I don't think that Joe Biden is anxious to have him or his family go through that process uh, when he gets out of office, which looks a lot sooner than maybe he originally uh, thought it would be. Yeah. Hey, hey, what's going on with um, Durham? I mean, when is that investigation going to come to a close, or when will we start learning what he the fi- his findings throughout this investigation? I, you know, John, I've always been a little skeptical about the whole Durham thing. Um, I, I, first off, I am not a fan of special counsels mm-hmm. because this is usually what happens with special counsels. They don't actually produce prosecutions on the uh, on the central matter. They just end up getting you know a few uh, you know tangential. Uh, process crimes, you know, like a, you know, obstruction or lying to investigators. That's that's as far as they usually go. Yeah. And I don't know that I expect anything else from Durham. That, that's not a reflection of Durham, but I, I just don't see where this is where this is going. And if there was something to go to, I mean, it's been what four years yeah, since the, yeah, since the, yeah. I mean, these things stretch on for years, and this is also, you know, not to be not to be too cynical about this, but special prosecute, special counsel um, appointments also tend to drag on for years, and it's about the money, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it employs people, you know, and so it tends to have this uh, self-perpetuating aspect to it. It's the reason why I really dislike special counsels, and I really wish that we would have a better way of dealing with conflicts of interest than appointing uh, roving, unaccountable prosecutors to just simply uh, Self perpetuate their own existence. Yeah, and, and when it comes to the to the to what's happened on January six, when you look at you know putting a, a a woman who I think think they said she has cancer and all that, who was just in there taking pictures, I mean, are they even looking to to not prosecute people like that who was just there taking pictures? Uh, now I, I believe go after the people who broke windows, you know, tore down whatever, went in and took stuff off out of the offices of these congresswomen and women but come on especially 
the people that were allowed in by the Capitol Police. I mean, are, are, are we have we gotten that far as a country where where we everything is all about punitive, punitive when it comes to uh, government? Well, I think that um, first off, I'm I I, I I think you have to establish that that's all they did, yeah. right? I mean, defenses make a lot of claims, and there might be evidence that there, that that person did something more inside the Capitol. I I haven't really watched. I haven't looked into that case yeah. in particular. But I think that usually what happens in these things is you go after the smaller fry, and you and you use them to roll up the bigger fry, right? right? Uh, and and that may be what the Department of Justice is doing here. I, I'm not really sure where this is going. I do know that uh, that some of the later indictments are more serious, yeah. and I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to build a witness. Um, you know, a witness backlog to prosecute some of the more serious cases. And that may be what this person is caught up in. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, know, you want to temper, you want to temper justice with mercy where you can, right? And it's, it, it gets back to the old adage, you know, let the, let the punishment fit the crime. Yeah. And, you know, certainly being in there was, you know, illegal. Um, there are ways to prosecute that that don't make you a felon for the rest of your life. Yeah, but if you're allowed um, in, all, I'm a former. But it, I'm, I'm a former cop. If you're allowed into a place, that's not trespassing. If 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 if, if the police, if the Capitol oh, police yeah. allowed them in, I don't see how that's trespass. Well, okay, so if they were if they were just allowed in, right? If they if they just walked up and said, "Hey, can we go in?" The cop said, "Yeah, sure, go ahead, go ahead and go in." Yeah, that's a. I would say that's a positive defense. But if the cops stood aside because of a threatening crowd, I think that that is – I think that there is a um, – what's the word I'm looking for? There, there's um, – it's certainly not necessarily a voluntary decision by the cop. Yeah. Now, it, under duress, I think, is the, is the term I'm looking for. So I think all of those factors uh, go into that, and certainly these people have – uh, very good defense attorneys. I actually know a couple of the defense attorneys that are involved in this, and they're very good. So they're going to be looking at all these angles and trying to make that uh, make that case to the court, to the jury, I'm sure. So Ed Morrissey, senior editor of HotAir.com, did you watch both primetime January 6th committee spectaculars? I haven't watched any of them. And, and really? Amy, I'm somebody, when I, was, when I was 11 years old, I was watching the Watergate hearings. So it's not like I'm not a nerd, okay? <laughs> I was like recording not... Ronald Reagan with the oh, Iranian boy. hostages every night. <laughs> this is a reason why we're friends, right? Because, you <laughs> exactly. know, we're, we're, we're peas in a pod here. But I haven't watched any of them because, you know, first off, it, this is not the proper committee structure. You don't have cross-examination. Exactly. This is really... This I know, is really but that's just what's a, a public beating. I know, but yeah. the, the, so listen, so this White House aide, Cassidy Hutchinson, I was so into her testimony because you know, she's like, Trump tried to grab the wheel to turn around to, you know, instead of going back to the White House, to the Capitol. The man's in a limo. Now, has she ever been in a limo? Physically, that's not possible. You're, no. you, you know, you can't, and then there's a barrier between you and the driver. I mean, give me a break. Well, so her claims are, are unraveling, and they're finding out that, you know, she's still a big, huge Trump supporter, but they got other messages from her that co- completely contradict what she said during primetime. Well, also, I mean, this was hearsay, right? That wasn't the right. proper form to bring that type of testimony in. And if there had been a adversarial setup on this committee, which yep. every committee has, except for this one, uh, the adversarial side would have brought that out, that she was actually testifying to what somebody else told her that somebody had said to that person oh, about what happened crazy. in the limo. So it was a game of telephone, basically. And but that I mean, wasn't the soundbite. No, of course not. Of course not. But that's the reason why it fell apart so quickly, too, is because it turned out that what she was told was hearsay, and it wasn't accurate hearsay, and the people who were involved in it said it didn't happen that way. And so it, it was... It burned her credibility, at least publicly. I don't know about oh, she's Kennedy, done. but it certainly burned her. Yeah, I mean, her credibility is toast. She'll write a book. So it's, it, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, everybody will write a book. Uh, Why I lied. <laughs> An after school special. <laughs> no. My adventures in limousines. Uh, yes. but, um, <laughs> oh, good Lord. The Logistics of Limousines, <laughs> Chapter 1. That's actually not a bad title. Logistics of limits. Isn't a bad title? No, it, you said it in no uncertain terms the other day. Oh, excuse me, I don't know where that came from. That wasn't me. Uh, that was a that was a mishap. Um, so, but what you know, when this is is it all over now? When you probably don't even know when this January sixth committee um, buffoonery is going to be done. Do you? Well, I don't think they know. 
they're talking about doing more in the fall. I mean, oh. I think that they're going to try to run this thing right through the midterms and maybe even maybe even to the end of the year. But I don't think people are paying attention. I'll just say this really quickly. People don't understand the radically different electoral context that is in place here in um, in, in 2022. We've got runaway inflation at 40-year highs. We've got a president who is deeply unpopular. We've got American households that are absolutely melting down financially because of the economy that's going on right now and the erosion of buying power that's been going on for the last 15 months. This is this is in 2010. It's not 2014. It's not 2018. This is an electoral context yeah. that we haven't seen in 40-something years. Yeah. And I don't think people grasp the focus that the economy is going to have in this. And the January 6th committee hearings, the Supreme Court decisions, all of that is going to be by the wayside because people are concerned about their pocketbooks, about their savings, about their retirement. And they want a change. And that's what that's the context in which all of this is taking place. This is almost a non sequitur yeah. to what people are actually concerned about in this election. But cycle. don't forget, don't forget, that's why they want to change the Electoral College. That's why they're having these th- these meetings and, and talking about introducing a bill, or I think they've already introduced a bill to change the um, how we elect our president. That's that's more important than and then people losing their, their livelihoods. There's, you know, kids and, and, and more people committing suicide. That's more important than, all, and, than the real stuff that's actually happening happening and affecting real people. Right. And besides which, you can't do it with a bill. It requires a constitutional amendment, and that's not happening. Yeah. All right, Ed Morrissey, we're going to have to leave it there for today, as always. Thanks for joining us. And uh, well, he's thanks. editor of HotAir.com, and we'll have you back soon. Thank you very much. Take care. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Listen to Dan and Amy on your smartphone. Download the AM560 mobile app today at 560theanswer.com slash mobile. Thanks for listening to Chicago's Morning Answer podcast sponsored by Signature Bank. Signature Bank takes pride in helping customers grow their business and provide unmatched banking expertise, custom financial solutions, and the industry's best technology. So whether you're a business looking for a deposit relationship or needs a ready source of financing, Signature Bank is the right bank for you. Call today at 773-467-5600 to hear how Signature Bank can help your business grow and thrive. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender.